there was no Maeve to greet me, so I assumed she'd gone off to one of her clubs or badminton, operatic or whatever. It was some time after that I found the note. Well, actually, it wasn't until I was going to bed. It was there on the pillow, and it wasn't really a note. It was more of a long letter, well, or even a short book. I won't bore you with it in its entirety, and to be perfectly honest, I couldn't. I threw it away years ago, but the essence of it was that she had left me. Apparently, she'd been unhappy for a long time, had not found me remotely sympathetic to her needs or her interests. Consequently, she had formed an attachment with somebody called Ivan. You must have remembered him. He played the second costermonger in My Fair Lady, lived in a large house in Watford and drove a Range Rover. Whatever that was all supposed to mean. She also left details of the estate agent... We had to use to put the house on the market, her solicitor's name and address, and an appointment with our bank manager for the next morning. I was stunned. This was a scenario for which I had made no preparation whatsoever. I can't say that I was particularly upset. I, I didn't sit on the edge of the bed, screwed up massive in trembling hands, saying, Oh God, a lot, and holding back floods of tears and making emotional phone calls to my mother. Well, uh, no, that is a lie, actually. I did call my mother, because she happens to be a solicitor, and although I knew that she couldn't act for me, I hoped that she could recommend someone who could, and in doing so wouldn't make a packet out of me. She said... She didn't know of a solicitor who wouldn't do that, but she did give me the name of one who was considered to be reasonably honest. The next morning, after phoning the office and making my excuses, I went to see the bank manager, but not until I had changed the time of the appointment. Now, I could easily have kept the one which Maeve had arranged for me, but I derived a pathetic satisfaction from this small act of rebellion. Having sorted out the joint account, a procedure which took all of ten minutes and for which I was charged an exorbitant amount, I bade goodbye to the bank and proceeded to the solicitor recommended by my mother. Now this happened to be a somewhat less satisfactory move than I had anticipated. The solicitor in question turned out to be the ex-wife of one of my old drinking companions, whose own divorce had turned out to be particularly messy. She was also a member of Mavis's amateur operatic group. She appeared to obtain needless satisfaction from telling me that this Ivan was a lovely guy who could, just mark this, just mark this, could get the role of one of the Nazis in the forthcoming production of The Sound of Music. Well, it was quickly agreed that my interest would be better served if she passed me over to one of her colleagues. This she did and the slow, laborious, due process of marital law was put into operation, and is still proceeding to this day to the benefit of the law practice in question and the detriment of my bank account. So much for Maeve. You could even say, so far as my bank account is concerned, so much for Maeve. It took rather longer than I expected to sort everything out, and it was a couple of weeks before I was back to normal. The house in Rickmansworth was on the market and expected to fetch a price far in excess of what we'd paid for it, not that I imagined I was likely to benefit too much from that. Already pissed off totally with the business of commuting, I managed to acquire a share in a flat in Archway, over the local post office and grocery store, which was run by one who I imagined to be the last white corner shop come post office proprietor in England, and I was sharing with a work colleague, an aggressively gay man who promised not to try and induct me into his preferred practices so long as I cleaned the cooker once a week. This seemed the best offer I'd have for ages, so I moved in. During this time, I had not forgotten my lady in green. True, circumstances had dictated that she'd be put temporarily on hold, so to speak. But now things were beginning to sort themselves out, and I could resume my campaign. What campaign? Ah, now you've got me. Hadn't he actually got around to one? In any event, it could all prove to be a complete waste of time. 
She might be happily married. For God's sake, some couples had to be. Or she had probably got me down as some sort of inarticulate pervert. Supposing I never clapped eyes on her again. Didn't know anything about her, her name, where she worked, where she lived. All I knew was that she favoured green and I liked the look of and the sound of her. In a place like London, that is not a lot to go on. Thus far, I had entrusted myself to what I like to think as fate, but in reality was likely to be anything other than a series of happy coincidences. So what I asked myself could I do to influence this tide of affairs of mine? Back came the tentative answer, try logic. Well, from what has gone before, it might fairly be assumed that logic was not my strong point. Perhaps so, but in defence it has to be said that my school and university results were more than satisfactory and that I hold down a highly responsible, well-paid job. If I have an Achilles heel, it is only so far as the opposite sex is concerned, and here I cannot believe that I am the only man to find out that this is an area in which logic appears to play very little part. Whenever in the company of an attractive woman, any woman, I just seem to lose touch with reality. I respond in monosyllabic grunts and generally come over as the village idiot. Maeve or perhaps we might revert to Mavis now, always used to say that she took me on because she viewed me as an interesting, ongoing anthropological experiment. And, like a prat, I felt I owed her my undying gratitude for taking on the job. Well, that was all in the past. And for want of anything better, logic was now to be the way forward. Well, at least, I hoped it was. The first task was to review the events that had taken place. Where had I bumped into the girl in green from St Albans? That was easy, because, apart from the one occasion at the theatre, it had been in the vicinity of Selfridges, close to where I worked. Possibly she also worked in the area. Perhaps in Selfridges itself. It was unlikely, I reasoned. Firstly, she didn't look like a sales girl, although she could have been in administration or a window dresser. No, no, not a window dresser. They walk around with pins stuck all over them and wear the sort of clothes that announce they've been in the art school. Administration was a possibility, as was the fact that she could work somewhere else in the Marble Arch area and just do her shopping there. Plenty of other people did. Still, that was all I had to go on. So selfish as it was, and if that failed, I suppose I could always come out in St Albans Railway Station, assuming she still lived there and commuted. The next day, I spent my lunch break hanging around the front of Selfridges. Not quite the simple task, it seems. Selfridges is enormous and has more exits than your average rabbit warren. I did that for the next two weeks, except on Sunday, of course, and drew a complete blank. Apart from one or two security people, who were beginning to give me some very funny looks as the days passed, nothing. Fruitless though the exercise might have been, it did at least indicate that she didn't work there. She could have been on holiday, I suppose, and with that in mind, I extended the surveillance for a further five days. Still nothing. Obsessive? No. Not really. I mean, I had time on my hands now. No more travelling up and down to London from Rickmansworth. The pub in Soho wasn't holding too much appeal. Too many questions from my drinking buddies there. And sympathy was the last thing I was after. I could have spent more time in the flat, I suppose, but the lifestyle of my flatmate wasn't very conducive for someone who was nurturing a hopeless heterosexual passion, or he thought he was. So I continued looking around the area. Walking through Hyde Park was a pleasant lunchtime alternative. The weather was fine, and I would spend a quite contented lunch hour with a book or just sitting down with a coffee, people gazing. You never know, I kept telling myself. One day she might just stroll past. She didn't, of course. She didn't stroll past me in Hyde Park. But she did stroll past my office window, though. Hmm. Some three months after this fiasco of a search had started. I often think that London is at its best in early autumn. 
Many of the summer visitors have gone home, school, universities have started, new terms, the oppressively heated pavements have cooled down, and the town for a few months is left to the people who actually live and work there. I was sipping a coffee at my desk, idly looking out of the window as the first leaves were drifting about, when I saw her. Again, the flash of green, autumnal this time, subdued and suitably seasonal. She was walking on the opposite pavement, down towards Oxford Street, and inevitably heading for Selfridge's Food Hall. My office is on the second floor, and within five seconds, well, might be a slight exaggeration there, I was in the street, trying to put on my jacket with one hand and wondering what to do with a half-empty cup of coffee in the other. Negotiating the road was not a problem. London might be going through a bit of a lull, but the traffic was, as usual, at a standstill and I made it to the entrance to the food hall without incident. Apart, that is, from sloshing half a cup of coffee over the front of a stationary Land Rover. Hmm, I wondered. And then, throwing the now empty cup into a bin, I was inside the building just in time to see her disappear in the direction of the escalators. Ah, thank God she wasn't taking the lift. We finished up on the lingerie floor, probably my worst nightmare. And I dodged from rail to rail, keeping a suitable distance and without losing sight of her. She appeared to be intent on buying knickers or whatever those shreds of material are called. So I hung about behind one of the nightwear rails, thinking desperately of a strategy which might liberate me from my dribbling hamster image. And just then I felt a light but firm hand on my shoulder, and a voice quietly but with authority said, Excuse me, sir. I turned around and found myself looking at a security man. He looked hard at me for a few seconds and then said, Oh, it's you, is it? I was puzzled. Uh, do we know each other? I asked. <laughs> oh, yes, he replied, still gently holding my shoulder. Not long ago, we all knew you. Oh, yes. We had our eyes on you. You were the gentleman who was hanging about the store all hours. For weeks. We wonder what you were up to. <laughs> now I think we know, don't we? Oh no, just a minute, I said, panicking slightly and raising my voice more than I meant to. You're making a big mistake here. And take your hand off my shoulder. The grip tightened slightly. Now then, sir, let's keep it nice and quiet, shall we? You just accompany me to the office upstairs. We're sorted out there. My panic heightened. Look, I, I, I've come to buy this. There's no law against that, is there? The this happened to be the first thing I could grab off the rail, and I waved it in his face. And by now, people were beginning to watch, aware that some sort of minor drama was about to unfold, and I could just detect the first faint expression of uncertainty cross his face. The uncertainty increased as he relaxed his hold on me when a voice I knew but never honestly expected to hear again said, Oh, you darling. Oh, you've bought them for me, you sweetheart. She was standing there with a selection of thongs in her hand and a brilliant smile on her face. One thing I wasn't going to do was to concentrate on the handful of thongs. The guard stepped back. Sorry, sir, you'll find the pay punches just over there, sir. He walked away, and this time it was his turn to look puzzled. As for me, I was way beyond the puzzled stage. But my next move was obvious. I had to pay for whatever it was I'd grabbed from the rail. She accompanied me, still grinning, and said, You don't really have to buy them now, you know. Do you want me to put them back for you? No way, I said putting the purchase on the counter and looking at it for the first time. It, or rather, they were a pair of pyjamas, mossy sort of green and silk and very sexy. And when the sales assistant told me how much I owed her, I hastily put away the handful of notes I'd taken out of my pocket and instead extracted a credit card from my wallet. God, were they expensive? I turned to the woman who'd come to my rescue. She was still smiling, and waiting her turn to go to the till. I was determined not 
to descend into village idiot mode, so I smiled back at her and said simply, Thank you. She made no reply, so I went on. Once more in danger of sounding stupid, I, I really wasn't going to steal them, you know. I'm, I'm not a shoplifter. I'm not a hamster either. And, uh, now she looked puzzled, so I hastened on. Look, do you fancy a coffee? Um, uh, when, when you pay for those? I averted my eyes from the thongs, but not before. I noticed there wasn't a green one among them. The green disappeared, but she said, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll join you in the cafeteria. Right then, I said and with my Selfridges bag in hand, went up to the cafeteria, never for one moment, thinking that she would join me. But she did. Her name is Sarah. She's 33, divorced and living in Primrose Hill, almost next door to Archway. St Albans was where her parents lived. I ordered her a coffee, espresso with sugar, picked up the bag containing the silk pyjamas, and presented it to her. You should have these, I said. You've earned them. She instantly became distant. Oh, no, she said. No, you give those to your wife. I'm not here to accept gifts from men I don't know. Look, let, let's get this straight. I'm just coming out of a horrible divorce, and I wouldn't inflict what I have just been through on any other woman. I'd better be going. Before she could get up, I explained that I didn't have a wife. Well, technically I did, but not one to whom I would be giving any presents. She sat down again and said, They're beautiful. Do I love the colour and silk? Oh, wow. Are you sure? I mean, just at the moment, I, I couldn't even think of buying anything extravagant as those. Oh, please, I said. Please. I mean, I mean they're going to look lousy on me. Please take them. And, and, and please, please don't go. You have no idea how long I have... Um, uh, well, uh, look, let, let's have another coffee. So we did. We talked. We talked. And we talked. And we talked. I have to say that Primrose Hill suits me fine. Sarah suits me fine. And the green pyjamas have suited her quite beautifully for quite some time now. So all in all, this has turned out rather well. 